public forum resolution for April and for TOCs is going to be resolved committing United States ground combat troops to fight ISIL is in the best interest of the United States. This is kind of like last year's Nationals resolution in that its resolution is going to be very time sensitive in terms of which arguments are and are not valid by the time it is argued, especially by the time the end of April, beginning of May roll around. We're going to talk a little bit about the context, then the wording, then the balance between sides, then some individual arguments, and then from there about how we can expect the topic to develop between now and when it is actually debated. So the context of this has to do with Obama's seeking a reauthorization for the use of military force, specifically to go after ISIL, and Democrats saying this needs to be limited more, it is too broad, and Republicans saying this is too narrow, it rules out committing ground combat troops in the long term, and that's where the actual clash in Congress is on this right now. That said, this debate isn't necessarily about the option so much as whether or not it should be done. So we'll get to that in a little bit. When we talk about committing, committing is used instead of sending. You can look at it in terms of making commitment, you can look at it in terms of simply saying that you will. Most teams are going to go with the former definition that committing means putting them there for the long term, rather than simply saying giving the option to send. The idea is, is it a commitment to our allies? Is it a verbal commitment? Is it just a simple material commitment? There are a couple ways this can be taken, but generally it's not going to be too different from sending. United States ground combat troops. United States appears twice in this resolution. I'm not sure what other kinds of ground combat troops the United States could commit. So we're going to look at ground combat troops. They didn't specifically say ground troops or just United States troops. They said ground combat troops, which is generally a term of art. The U.S. pulled all ground combat troops out of Iraq in the context of U.S. presence committed to the Middle East back in 2009-2010. We have had troops in Iraq since then who have been on the ground and who have engaged in combat, but they have not been ground combat troops as it is collectively defined. That's generally referring to a large occupying infantry presence. We're talking about ground combat troops. It's very often used in these debates as a contrast to special operations troops or special forces. Special forces specifically refers to one kind of army special operations troops. Special operations troops in general are very often sent as trainers or advisors. Their mission does not have a combat mandate even if they are embedded in groups and may engage in combat with that group, it is not a United States ground combat mission that the United States has committed troops to. This could certainly be a point of contention in debate. One way that proteins might try to narrow the gap in terms of ground on this topic is by saying that troops on the ground who have the potential to engage in combat are ground combat troops and we just need to defend the 2600 U.S. Special Operations Forces who are currently in Iraq. Aside from that, it says to fight ISIL. It's not necessarily to defeat, it's not necessarily to contain, this is kind of broad, this gives pro back a little bit of the ground they've lost from the collective ground combat troops. ISIL is the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, also ISIS, Islamic State in Iraq and al-Sham, the Levant, or al-Sham, is a geographical region of the Middle East that covers parts of seven countries, predominantly Syria, which is why you will often see various U.S. media sources abbreviate ISIS as the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria to simplify things. At the same time, ISIL is the terminology that the military and the White House tend to use. The organization just calls itself IS, the Islamic State, but at the same time, the U.S. does not like to use that term because it doesn't like to specifically admit that they are the Islamic State. It maintains that many of its allies in the area are also Islamic States, and it's kind of more of a propaganda battle than anything else in terms of what they are called. Daesh is D-A-E-S-H. It is the same functional abbreviation, but in Arabic instead. 
It's what most of the neighboring countries call them. It does not say the U.S. should commit ground combat troops to fight the Islamic State and should do so in Iraq and in Syria. It's not what the resolution is saying. It is talking about fighting the entity that is ISIL wherever they may be. So at the same time, it's kind of difficult to parametricize the topic down to a specific country unless they happen to expand beyond there. If ISIL does expand beyond Iraq and Syria, then fighting them in places other than the ones that are in their name is probably still fighting against ISIL, the entity. So from there, it talks about in the best interests of the U.S. Not in the interests, in the best interests. Con teams will interpret this as must be optimal, and that if a pro team shows that the situation might get bad enough in a worst case scenario you would need ground troops, that scenario is still not in the best interests of the United States. The pro team is going to say that best interest is just a term of art that means this something is a good idea. So when we say something is in the best interests versus in the interest, we could say, well, right now it's in the interests of the United States because they haven't done it, but it should be in their interests and is therefore in their best interests. And that's the way the phrase is most commonly interpreted when it is used in public forum resolutions. Again, of the United States, we've already established as the United States, not much more to say there. So let's look at the balance on this topic. The trouble with this topic as it exists is it very heavily favors the con team. Most pro-authors, even the most rabid interventionist pro-authors you normally find on topics like this, take Max Boot for instance, are not arguing that we need to send ground troops in, they argue we should not get rid of the option to send ground troops in. And that there might be a situation in the future where we would need ground troops, and in that situation it would be very silly for the president to limit the power of himself or of the next president to commit ground combat troops to deal with that. And that even if we have no intention of sending ground combat troops, we should not signal that to ISIL by forbidding ourselves from doing so. But even the most extreme of the legitimate con, so the legitimate pro-authors on this topic are arguing that we should have the ability to, not that we necessarily should. So at that point, it becomes kind of hard to actually find solid pro-literature on the topic. Pro needs to win that ISIL is a threat to the United States, and that sending in ground combat troops will alleviate that threat. And that's kind of a high bar, given that right now Iraq is trying to go alone with airstrikes, and specifically because neither Iraq nor Syria wants U.S. ground combat troops in their country, and to do so, we would have to invade Iraq or invade Syria for their own good. That offers a lot of con turns. Con, meanwhile, doesn't need to defend that we should never send them in, that the situation could not escalate to the point that ground combat troops would be necessary. They simply need to defend that right now, training, airstrikes, and collaboration works better than sending in troops that Iraq has said it neither wants nor needs, and that sending them into Syria would get a pretty bad reaction from Iran or Russia, given that we've backed off from airstriking Syria, backing off from invading Syria is not exactly a huge stretch. So, as the resolution stands right now, I think that Khan has a big advantage over Pro. I think that Pro is both predictable and more limited, and that the literature tends to trend Khan for the actual question of the resolution, which is not the question being debated in Congress. If Pro had to defend keeping the option on the table, then Pro would be in line with where the right wing is in Congress right now, and Khan would be in terms of limiting authorization for use of military force, limiting executive power. Though again, that's kind of moot too, because the previous 2001 AUMF is still in effect, and still gives the President power to send any American military forces anywhere, as long as it's in the name of fighting terrorism. Okay, let's look at some of the arguments. One of Pro's arguments is probably going to be that ISIL is a threat and will conduct terrorist attacks against the U.S. unless it's stopped, and the only way to stop them is to send in ground troops. The trouble with this is that ISIL is much more inwardly focused than many other Islamic extremist groups. ISIL very often will make its new recruits burn their passports and promise to stay in the country, which is kind of a counterproductive thing to do if you want them to leave and conduct terrorist attacks. 
terrorist attacks have been conducted in the name of ISIL in Australia, in Canada, in Europe. But these are not the people who were sponsored by ISIL. The attacks were not planned by ISIL. They simply dedicated the attacks to them. Well, ISIL may have cheered the attacks, it did not actually do them. Just like North Korea cheering 9-11 does not mean North Korea caused 9-11. The fact that ISIL is an inspiration to other extremist groups does not necessarily mean that they are a threat that can be eliminated through that kind of military force. At the same time, unlike many other groups, ISIL does consider itself a state. It considers itself a caliphate, to be precise, which requires holding territory, which requires having governance over a region. So there are certainly arguments that pro teams can make about how ground combat troops to take hold and build can be effective against them in ways that would not be effective against Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, AQAP, Boko Haram, etc. So at that point, you're looking at a situation where Pro can claim that ground combat troops would be more effective there, except for the fact that there's certainly arguments to be made as far as U.S. ground combat troops in the region being the motivating cause behind ISIL in the first place. In particular, the sectarian violence in Iraq, in particular its relation to the U.S. surge during the late Bush administration, there's a lot that can be talked about back and forth there. So while that is going to be a common pro point, pro is going to have a tough time establishing whether the threat to the U.S. is immediate, or that sending in ground troops will necessarily reduce the threat. Another argument that pro can make is that other countries are already sending in ground troops and we don't want to be left behind in the result of that. Khan's going to say, well, if those countries are sending ground troops anyway, we don't need to bother, but this really boils down either side to the notion that this is not actually a war between the U.S. and the Islamic State. This is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran being fought in Iraq, with Ir Iranian militias training Iraqi militias and helping them, and Saudi Arabia obviously officially does not fund ISIL anymore, but certainly still funds segments of the Iraqi population who are attracted to ISIL, not because of its message necessarily, but because it is the only group that they don't think is likely to oppress their ethnic or religious subgroup. I do not want to simplify this down to Shia versus Sunni because there's a lot more going into it than that, but it's certainly something that requires a, a good deal more time than I can get into in just a 20 minute video or so. That said, it's worth noting there are a lot of different sects of Sunni Islam in Iraq, some of which are more attracted to ISIL's message than others, some of which are considered heretics by ISIL. So it's not as simple as, oh, all, all the Sunnis want to be part of ISIL and all the Shias are funded by Iran. And if you find an article that does that, that is usually a good sign that you should find a better article. So what Pro could do with this argument is say, right now, ISIL is being pushed back, is being contained, is being defeated, by Iranian and the Iraqi government's troops. If the U.S. just sits back, then it's going to lead to huge Iranian influence over Iraq, which is bad for the stability of the region in the long term. So that's another argument that you might see pro teams making. Another argument is just the idea that ISIL is bad, ISIL is really, really bad, ISIL is committing human rights violations on par with, well, their neighbors, but they're videotaping them and putting them on the internet and using social media to brag about them. And that as a result of that, we have a moral obligation to go in and stop them, even if the countries who they are fighting against do not want our help, we still have an obligation to help anyway. And that kind of goes back to the UN peacekeeping topic and whether a country forfeits sovereignty when it cannot provide basic obligations to its citizens. At that point, Again, the con answers to that don't look too different than the con answers on the January topic. But really, there's not too many other reasons to send ground combat troops other than to militarily defeat ISIL. There are some other fringe arguments that can be made as well. For instance, a pro team might say that 
Japan is seriously considering rearmament as a result of the unchecked threat from ISO and the execution of Japanese nationals, and that as a result of that, anything the U.S. can do to contain them helps to stop Japan from rearming, which is good for regional peace and stability, and deals with a bigger threat overall. It's not the strongest or most direct pro contention, but it does have the benefit of not having proof that ISIL itself is a threat, so much as the continued existence of ISIL allows for other threats to be created. And you can certainly see similar things when talking about Syria and Russia, Syria and Iran, etc. The Iranian situation can also be taken in the opposite direction by unconventional protein who wants to. Rather than arguing we need to send in help, to balance against Iranian influence, proteins can also make the arguments that ISIL puts the US and Iran in an unlikely alliance, and sending help is going to actually improve our chances of reaching a deal which avoids long-term conflict in the Middle East, and that this can be a common cause for us and Iran. Again, I think relatively few proteins will run this argument, but it's possible. Again, most of these pro-arguments are fairly fringe, the majority of pro teams are going to have a pretty straightforward argument on this topic. Khan has a lot more options, and most of the options as they stand right now are pretty good. Khan can argue that it's better for us to use airstrikes and other people to use ground troops. They can argue that U.S. ground troops will increase ISIL recruitment. They can argue that ISIL celebrated when U.S. airstrikes happened and has been asking very nicely for U.S. ground invasions since then. They can argue that a U.S. ground invasion suddenly turns this into a war between Islam and Crusaders, which draws in people who were Muslims opposed to ISIL beforehand. It can be seen as them being right all along. It could galvanize other terrorist groups. It could overstretch the U.S. military in ways that reduce its capacity to respond to actual threats elsewhere. There's also just all kinds of defensive arguments Khan can make about ISIL doesn't really have terrorist ambitions abroad outside of the caliphate. ISIL is going to collapse under its own weight once some of the oil money runs out. ISIL can't continue to exist because it refuses to recognize and make peace with any surrounding government. ISIL's days are numbered and the only thing to prolong it is U.S. going in after it. And those are all fairly stock but fairly strong arguments for the Khan team. The other thing that Khan team can do is approach this from just an international law perspective. Again, the idea that if a country says, we do not want U.S. troops in there, and we say, yes, but there are very bad people in your country and we need to kill them, that does not mean that we can avoid that country's request that we not send ground combat troops. So unless Iraq, or even less likely Syria, asks for the U.S. to do so, between now and the topic is debated, that's certainly something you'll hear a lot of con teams talking about. The other thing is U.S. authors who have looked at the possibility for this Estimates have been around 9 brigades, 12 brigades, 100,000 United States troops sent into Iraq. They've said anything less than that doesn't have a chance of succeeding, but at that point you're talking about a major second war, and there are all kinds of other reasons that that might not be in the best interest of the United States, even if it did marginally increase our security by eliminating, or more likely splintering, one major group. So those are the arguments that you'll see most commonly on this topic. The way the topic is going to develop. Well, there's a couple of things that can happen. More countries could, sorry, more groups could pledge allegiance to ISIL. In particular, Boko Haram in northern Nigeria declared a caliphate last month, and it wasn't clear if they were saying this is a separate Islamic state, or if they were saying we are going to be part of ISIL's vision. That got clarified yesterday. They are saying they support ISIL, that they are declaring allegiance to ISIL, and at that point, pro teams could certainly talk about whatever ISIL has expanded to between now and the topic being a better place to send ground troops than necessarily Iraq or Syria, or that a rapid expansion would mean more need to send them in. Similarly speaking, you could also see a pro team talking about how setbacks in the conflict between now and then justify troops. If Iraq changes its mind and asks for U.S. help, that is certainly going to be something to make the debate more even between now and then. Currently, Iraq is attempting to take back several cities in ISIL territory without the U.S.'s help, without even airstrikes. They're conducting their own airstrikes. 
and they have some ground assistance from Iran, but there's been a battle going on for Tikrit for the past several days, and how that plays out, and how successful that Iraqi campaign is in pushing up to Mosul between now and then, could certainly decide how this works out. The topic would be much more balanced if Iraq suffered some bad defeats, if ISIL managed to make some big wins against the Iranian militias, against the Iraqi military, against the Kurdish Peshmerga. There's all kinds of things that could make the topic more balanced, and frankly, I hope the topic does not become more balanced. Because the only way this topic actually comes even between the two sides is for a lot of horrible things to happen to a lot of people, and anything that makes the topic actually more debatable with pro makes the world a worse place overall. So while competitive equity at the TRC would be nice, it's not going to happen without tens of thousands of people getting killed and multiple military disasters happening in the Middle East. Much like the Ukraine topic, I will do an update on this one based on what good or bad news we have in current events as TOC approaches. Stay tuned for that. In the meanwhile, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comments.